So welcome everybody. We're really um, excited. This is our final day, unfortunately, for our Antarctica Week Festival. And um, we want to thank everyone who has joined us throughout the week, if, they, if you have. It's been really, really great to have you with us. And if it's the first time you're joining us, then welcome. Um, this is the ninth talk of 10 that we've got going on this week. And today, uh, very excitingly, we actually have Fabian Valdez from the United States Antarctic Programme. Um, and he is joining us actually from Antarctica at McMurdo, which is the US Antarctic Station. Um, and he's the, he coordinates and manages the maintenance and repairs of equipment in the deep field camps. So I'm hoping it's going to be quite an exciting talk today. Um, if you have joined us recently uh, during this week, you'll know that we you know the talk will go on for about 30 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. So there's, you could, if you want to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, you can do that. And then uh, please also remember if you want to, you can put in your school name or you know where you're from. So we can give you a bit of a shout out with your question or we'll try to. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna hand you over to Fabian and uh, we'll hear from him first and then we'll do Q and A's after. So thank you. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to McMurdo Station Antarctica. Uh, before we get going, I'm going to pick up the camera and just give you a view of what I see every day. So here in Antarctica, it's 1030 at night and you can see it's nice and shiny and bright. Um, this time of the year, the sun does not set. And you can see the buildings right below me down there. And in the background, if you're able to, you can see the Transantarctic Mountains. And all that flat white is the Ross Ice Shelf. That's quite the view we have there. Yeah, um, it's great. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. So, excuse me just a second. Here we are, ice, ice tractors in the extreme. Um, we're gonna talk about tractors in Antarctica. Um, we run several different types and we will get this started. I, once again, I'm Fabian Valdez. I've been a mechanic in Antarctica for several years. And here we go. Well, Antarctica is at the bottom of the world, but I'm sure everybody here knows where it is right now. And we are coming from McMurdo Station, right there. <clears throat> My journey will start from the United States where I fly to Christchurch, New Zealand. And then from Christchurch, New Zealand, I take a Air Force jet down to McMurdo Station. So where we want to go is the Thwaites Glacier. But here's a quick picture of McMurdo. You can see there's a lot of buildings, um, a lot of work centers, all kinds of different types of work gets done here. That's a great view. So here we are headed to Thwaites Glacier. So from McMurdo to Thwaites Glacier, that is one long distance. It is about 1,700 kilometers. And the way we get there is by plane. This here is called a LC-130 Hercules, or we just call them as Herx. Do you see the skis at the bottom of the plane? That's how it's able to land on the snow. We have other planes as well. These are much smaller. This is a Basler. Do you see the skis on that one? This one's able to carry fewer people and smaller cargo, and it takes about eight hours to go from McMurdo to Thwaites on this air aircraft. So once we get to a field camp, there are no buildings out there. So we live in tents. <clears throat> 
here's a picture of a field camp. It's not on the Thwaites Glacier, but it gives you an idea of what a field camp will look like. There are a lot of large camps that we could work out of, and there are a lot of small tents that we are able to sleep in. This is waste divided as a camp that supports the Thwaites Glacier. And these camps typically stay up for about three to four months to support all the scientists coming in and out of the Thwaites project. This is another camp. Do you see all the large equipment and materials and all the large buildings there? All this stuff needs to get to field camps and planes cannot always take them all. So we end up using big equipment. We use big tractors to move everything, all the heavy objects, all the stuff that can't fit in planes. And another reason we choose big equipment to tow everything is because planes can't fly in bad weather. And there is a lot, a lot of bad weather here in Antarctica. For our tractors could go in all types of weather, good or bad. So this is a tractor traverse that will take all of our supplies from camp to camp to support all science projects. But Antarctica is mostly flat and nothing really there. There are no fuel stations. There's no restaurants and there's no, no hotels. So we have to carry everything, all of our fuel, all of our food, our beds, our supplies and our cargo, we have to traverse it all. And we do that by using tractors. We have modules, which are just buildings with skis, very similar to this one here. Inside these modules, we'll have beds like this. Now these modules could sleep several people. Now doesn't that look comfortable? Sometimes there are not enough beds and some people will have to sleep in a tent while traversing. That's one cozy tent right there. These tents could house up to one to four people, depending on the size. Another module we have is a kitchen module. Here we can do all of our cooking where we'll have our meals and, and just relax and have a good time. It has everything from stoves to microwave to cooking utensils, everything that we need. Did you notice the cord over the stove? We have to secure everything on the shelves and on the countertops to make sure nothing falls on the floor while we're traversing and we're going over rough terrain. Now there's not that many of us on a traverse. So we, we don't take up too much room. We enjoy it on a nice small table where we could relax and eat our meal. Another important thing is our toilet. We have to carry that with us because we can't pollute in Antarctica. So we have to store it and house it and all waste gets shipped back to McMurdo to be sent off continent for removal. Here we are fueling our fuel bladders. We carry all of our fuel in what we call a fuel bladder, which is this rubber bladder that houses thousands of liters of fuel at one time. You could tell they're full when they become puffy and cylindrical. So once we have all of our supplies and cargo and fuel and food, we start our traverse. So let's talk about tractors a little bit. Here I am on a 
Caterpillar Challenger 55. It is a tractor we use to traverse through Antarctica. Here's another Challenger 55 with a blade attachment. We're able to attach different accessories to the tractor to do multiple jobs other than just towing, like pushing snow or moving cargo. Here is another tractor. This is a case quad track. It is a very large, very powerful, and we call it a quad track because of the four tracks it has. Here's another tractor. This is a Tucker Snowcat. It has four tracks as well, but is much smaller. It can carry loads just as well as any other tractor. Here's another Tucker Snowcat, but a much older one. Which one do you guys prefer? Have you noticed that all the tractors have tracks instead of wheels? Well, that's because tracks give us better traction and our chances of getting stuck decreases. So here we are traversing across Antarctica with all of our supplies, our fuel, and everything needed. Now, Antarctica is very flat and seem like there may not be nothing there, but sometimes there could be stuff beneath the snow, such as crevasses. Now, crevasses are just large gashes in the snow um, and they could have a snow bridge on top. So we can tell that they're here. Here's a side view of one and you can see the snow bridge, which the person is standing on. Now, if this snow bridge is not thick enough, our tractors could fall in and get stuck. So what we do to prevent this from happening is we use a ground penetrating radar. You can see it here in front of this red tractor. You can see how it sticks out way in front of the tractor. That's so that it can find the crevasse before we drive over it. So the radar sends a signal to the cab with the computer where the radar technician reads and records what's happening. This is Zoe showing us, keeping us safe from all crevasses. Now, if we come across a crevasse we can't pass safely, we can, do, we can open it up and fill it in. We fill it in by using the tractors with the large blades. We just push snow and snow until the, it is full all the way to the top, and then we can safely drive over it. We also use those blades to build these large berms, which are just hills built out of snow. You can see several berms here. We, we house all of our cargo on them that are gonna be at a camp for more than a few years, so we don't have to bring everything back to McMurdo every year. We mark which is it, what is in every group and where it's at on the berm so we can find it easily next season. Here we are putting everything on the berm, making sure it's all strapped down and secured for the winter. We, we mark everything on the berm with flags. So that way during the winter when the storms come, it'll dump a lot of snow around the area and we don't want things to get lost. So the flags will show us where everything is. Here we are at the beginning of a season. Can you see the snow drifting around all the berms? Here's a closer look. You can see the snow drifting all the way around all the equipment there. That's why we put them on berms to help keeping it from getting completely buried.
see here, here's some more, here's how the berms can get buried, but we do mark them so we could find them easily. We'll mark them on all the corners and all the sides so we know where to dig. That would have been, that's a lot of digging if we did not create the sperm. Here's a technician digging out a tractor. It is quite buried. We have to dig all the way around the tractor, getting all the snow away from it so we can start it up and put it to work. Here's that Tucker snowcat we were talking about earlier. You can see that the tracks, the rear tracks are completely covered. So what we do when we get to the field camp on a plane is we all grab a shovel and we just start digging and we dig. We dig all the way around the tracks and underneath it and behind it, we dig all the snow out. We dig all the snow from underneath it completely so we could expose all the components of the equipment and make sure there's no issues. Now, once all the tractors completely dug out, it's time to start on the engine. You can see that the snow packs in the engine compartment. So we have to dig all the snow out of there. This one, we could put heat on the engine too to help melt it out. Once it's dug out, we we got to do maintenance and service. Here we are doing an oil change to get the tractor ready to, to put in service. Once the tractors are ready to be used, we get them starting to working on grooming a skiway so the Hercules plane can land. We groom the skiway because the drifts on the snow parades can be very bumpy and hard and make it for a very rough landing for the plane. I forgot to talk about the groomer. But it's a good thing we marked this one so it didn't get lost. Here's the groomer attached to a tractor. The groomer is just a large metal blade that is dragged across the snow to smooth it out and remove any hard spots. So after weeks of hard work and lots and lots of digging, we are ready for planes to start bringing in scientists groups in to do their research. I forgot to tell you all, I'm also a superhero. Here I am in my Batman outfit, watching the airplane get unload its cargo and people. The airplanes not only bring us cargo and, and scientists, they also deliver fuel. This is Katie getting ready to receive fuel from this from the Hercules. Now these next few photos are going to show you what it what it's like doing my job here in Antarctica. Being a mechanic, we work in all conditions, all weather, and we do all sorts of jobs. Anything that breaks on these tractors, we fix. Sometimes you need help from another friend. Here's Logan giving me a hand fixing this tractor. Here we are in a cold day trying to fix the tractor. You could tell it's cold by all the snow on us and how bundled up we are. Now, sometimes jobs require to have no gloves on. These ones we try to do quickly so we can put our gloves back on and warm up. We work hard and we do, we do all sorts of repairs such as transfer cases and any other major components that fail on equipment. Here it is coming out. We were lowering it very slowly with straps. Being a mechanic in Antarctica, we have all types of tools used to do all the repairs on the equipment. We have pullers and screwdrivers and sockets and everything you need. 
like I said, we work in all kinds of cold weather, whether it's blowing snow, um, we can't see very well, just cold, cold weather, but we'll get any job done. Do you know, do you know what I think? I think it'd be a lot better if we had a building to work in equipment. Here's a building that goes up at one of our camps. It is a large tent that the equipment could fit in. See that the tractor fit all the way in and we can walk all the way around it and do all the repairs we need sheltered inside this nice tent. That makes my job so much easier. I'm so much happier. This is a wonderful tool right here. Let me introduce the crew that supported the weights last year. Starting from the left, we have Andy Burton, who was an equipment operator, and he, he operated all the tractors that you saw. Then is Brent, he was the Traverse supervisor. He made sure we had everything we needed and was heading in, in all the right directions while we were traversing. Next is Jessica, she was the mountaineer who kept us safe in case we came across any dangers. Logan Johnson is another mechanic that helped get all the tractors ready to go. There I am with my head out the window of the tent. So if you guys are ever in Antarctica, please come down and visit us. I'll let you drive one of our tractors. Feel free to come join us. Um, it is a great experience and come see what Antarctica is like and all everything it has to offer. All right, that was a nice little slideshow. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over. We are gonna play a short video for you showing traversing through Antarctica. Today we're doing some prep, fixing some stuff and uh, configuring loads, getting ready for tomorrow's departure. A traverse is a way to move large amounts of equipment out to deep field and remote sites for, uh, for research. It's pretty much the only way, so we have tractor trains that will take stuff out there. They need stuff out there, so we're the ones to take it to them. be a very quiet experience in terms of communication and verbal interaction but even though the fans running and the engines running and you can always hear some sort of noise it is a very introspective and quiet experience
Most Japanese buildings were made of wood. That tradition stemmed partly from a Japanese aesthetic preference for wood. I'm sorry, Miss Jackson. Ooh, I am for real. Never meant to make you go to cry. I apologize a trillion times. Got a fresh thing going on. You say it's puppy love. We say it's full grown. We've compared traversing in Antarctica to traveling on the ocean. There's some similarities there, like the, the long stretches out seeing land or seeing mountains. And we've also compared it to the like a lowbrow space program. We're incredibly remote. Uh, we have to carry everything with us and be self-supporting. Nowhere else will you be this far from anyone else. skip our 10 o'clock load check because we're going to just keep rolling to that uh, camp at the shear margin. It's only a few miles beyond the, uh, it's only a few miles beyond our 10 o'clock grade. So a shear zone is a place where uh, two ice streams are coming together and they travel at slightly different speeds. And where they're traveling at those different speeds, it creates friction between the two of them. And that friction causes crevasses to kind of open up. We've got a radar that we're gonna be pushing in front of us and, a, and looking through the snow down about 60 feet to see if there's any crevasses that are shown down there. Now we look at it from the surface and you really can't see anything at all. It looks like it's just flat white snow, but underneath there can be large crevasses for the next few miles is potentially the most dangerous part of the whole route. If we can create a safe route across it, we'll mark it with some flags. And then from there, drive the remaining 20 or so miles to subglacial Lake Mercer. They are still out there. Moving along. Well, today was a little bit slower of a day. We've been scouting out the shear zone. So, making some bread today. That went well for us. The first mile we found pretty much flat stratigraphy. After that, we found there were some interesting features. We didn't find any crevasses, so crossing looks really good for tomorrow. So now that we're at Subglacial Lake Mercer, we're working at building the runway that's going to be used next year for ski-equipped aircraft. We're also compacting the site where the camp is going to be next year so they don't have to set it up on some soft snow. And we're building mounds of snow, or we call berms, to put the drilling equipment that we'll have out here on so they can stay the winter and uh, not be too drifted by the time we come get it. I'll be in Antarctica for the next few years more than I will be in any other country. This year, 
2018, I'll be in Antarctica for 11 of the 12 months. Okay. Awesome. Well, that was a very nice video and presentation. I guess we can move on to any questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Fabian. It was really interesting because quite often a lot of the talks that we've had focus on the science and actually it's really good to actually see the logistics and operations of how all of that can happen. So I think, um, yeah, it's great. So what we'll yeah, do is yeah. start with some questions. Um, we've got uh, some that came in through registration and some that uh, are coming through the Q&A. So we'll get through as many as we can. Um, let's just start here. OK. So let's just start. We've got uh, one from a uh, primary school here in the UK, the year two, Ladybrook Primary in Bramhall, who wants to know, how do you know where you're going and which direction to travel? Because this, it's just so vast. Yeah, um, we use a lot of GPR systems that will record everything through the satellites, just like you would in any other, in any other vehicle or phone or anything you have. Uh, we pre-plan routes prior to that and we try to find a route and we just follow coordinates from one coordinate to the next and just follow the GPS unit. Yeah, because otherwise you wouldn't have any, you don't have anything that you can really see on the horizon to try and aim for. Nope, nope. The, everything's so flat and white that uh, you can't try to use anything, any mountain as set points or anything like that. So it has to re heavily rely on GPS units. So I've got a question here from Dan. It says, when you leave the tractors, why don't you store them inside and in crates? And how long do you go out there to work? Because of course they all get buried in snow and you have to dig them out. So why not store them in crates? A lot of the tractors are, are very large, too, too large for crates that we have. And it would just be more things we'd, we would have to try to figure out how to get out there. Um, right now, and if you put them in a crate, the crate would just end up getting buried. So you'd be digging one thing out after another. Um, we chose just to leave them out there. We haven't had much issues with them at all. It just requires a lot of digging. Okay. Oh, and um, we've had qu quite a few questions, but um, Bastian, who's eight, who's eight from Suffolk, he wants to know how you get the tractors to Antarctica. So to Antarctica, they will come one of two ways, um, either by a vessel that comes to McMurdo once a year. Uh, a lot of equipment comes in that way. Uh, the vessel will come in, we crane it off the vessel, and then we transport it from there by plane or driving. Um, another way is a large Air Force plane, a C-17 typically will fly in equipment for us if we need it. Um, depending on which way it goes is kind of depending on how soon do we need the piece of equipment on in Antarctica. And um, Craig's asking when, when you have the radar, <clears throat> when you're trying to, you know, search for the crevasses, how long do you have until the snow can change and crevasses can appear? So, you know, you might've gone over and the, you know, you see them or you don't see them. And then, I don't know, there may be more. Um, I, I believe that one changes from where you are in Antarctica. And I forget how, we set up guidelines to, we have to JPR it every so often um, to make sure it's safe. Um, I forget how often that is, um, every 30 or 60 days, something like that. Um, but they've set up plans to saying, hey, things can change quickly. So we just make sure we GPR everything. We feel comfortable of GPRing something and driving through it and then coming back a week later. Um, but if it's gonna be a month or two later, uh, we may very well just GPR it again, just to make sure that there's nothing new that happened. And I've got a, a question here from more Pugo class in Udale school, and they want to know what the biggest vehicle you have. 
The biggest vehicle we traversed with is a, it's a case 535 quad track um, or the MT865 Challenger. I, the quad track, they're very similar as far as power to pull stuff. The quad track just has better traction um, with the four tracks. So it's able to tow better by itself. Um, that's the biggest, biggest tractor we have that can tow. Okay, so following on from the biggest one is Aaron, who's eight from Wal Walden Primary, wants to know what your favorite type of tractor is. <laughs> oh, my favorite one is probably the Challenger 55s. Um, they're smaller, they're agricultural tractors. Um, I'm just amazed for how long we've had them down here and how well they performed for us. Have, and, and the job they've done. Um, they are on the older side, but they, they've done a very, very good job for being a stock tractor. Um, and I, I just, I kind of like them. <laughs> okay, a question here from Danielle, slightly different from tractors, but how many layers do you have to wear to survive the cold temperatures? Oh, so what you learn down here pretty quickly is you, you wear several layers. Um, the weather changes so quickly. Uh, you don't. You might start off beginning of the day with, with everything on. You have a base layer, and then in, uh, your regular clothes, and then an extra layer, and then your exterior, and that might be fine for the morning. And then two hours later, it's too hot, so you're down to just your base layers. And then two hours later, it gets cold again. It changes quickly, so you're, you have to be very well prepared, and you just, you wear several layers, and you adjust as needed throughout each day. <laughs> Depends. Okay, so a question here from Sarah says, do you lose a lot of mechanics tools in the snow? We do our very best not to lose any tools. Um, it has happened from time to time, but we do, the tools are a lifeline. So we, we have to make sure we keep a very good track, a very good track of them. Um, because we'll, we'll need them almost every day. Um, and so uh, I've got a, another question from uh, year four River Beach Primary. would like to know what happens when you break down, especially in a snowstorm. All right, well, so if we, if we break down and the snow, it depends on the snowstorm. If the snowstorm is, is very strong and you can't see anything outside, we may wait, we'll be all grouped together. We may wait until it clears up. Um, but if it's just windy and, and a little stormy, we'll go out and we'll fix it. Um, if it, and we will do any type of work out there. So, um, more than likely, depending what the weather, more than likely we're going to be out there in all kinds of weather, fixing whatever needs to get done. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just, there's so many questions that are coming through. It's really difficult to sort of try and just filter through them all. So everyone's really interested. Um, we've talked about the biggest, what about the coldest temperatures? That the challenges have operated in do they have a temperature that they will no longer function yes what we've discovered is newer equipment struggles in colder weather um, with all the electronics and sensors they have on it typically about 40 degrees negative is about as cold as you really want to go sometimes not even that cold um, the coldest i've operated tractors in have been about 33 degrees um, besides pole, um, pole during the winter, we ran equipment. I have a good friend that hit the coldest temperature he's ran a tractor in was 102 below um, for a very short time. Um, is that is that Fahrenheit the, the, or centigrade? Just ask, is that oh, Fahrenheit? Just because we you know, was, have different temperature gauges in the in <laughs> UK and the US. <gasps> Sorry, the 102 below would be Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, that's a bit, that's it's cold either way. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty cold. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So a question here actually from River Beach Primary. How do the red flag markers not fall or get submerged in snow? So when you use the flags to see mark where everything is, why do they not get buried or how do they not get buried? They're they're very they're it's a round pole, so the wind you, what what buries them is the wind will blow in snow and it catches anything. Being a thin round pole, the wind kind of scours around it and doesn't really catch much of a drift behind it. 
So it, it, it does a pretty good job like that. And then all the flags are screwed into the pole. So they, it, it takes a lot for them to get the actual flag to fall off the pole. Um, but a lot of it has to do with the pole being round and thin. Um, and I've got another question here, whether you have cell service or Wi-Fi while traversing. <laughs> Seems to be a concern of most uh, people these days having Wi-Fi. <laughs> Uh, we we have we don't have any cell service on the continent, um, nothing like that. We'll use a satellite phone to communicate back home, or or to if we need a call somewhere. We are starting to come out with a type of internet service, um, but it's not it's nothing that we're you're able to check all your social media or anything like that. It's just something we could send emails back and forth, um, but no cell service. Um. Okay, so do you have, here's a question from Craig, do you have to sp specifically train for being a mechanic in Antarctica, or are they skills that you could just transfer to being over there? Yep, uh, we typically transfer, it's, it's, uh, it's very different than a lot of most places in the world. Uh, for us being from the States, we do like to see mechanics that have, uh, have worked in cold states such as like North Dakota, Alaska, something like that, somebody who's used to dealing with the cold. Um, but as far as being able to work in Antarctica, we're looking after skills as well. Um, but so there's no specific training to work down here. And um, I've got a question here. Um, have you actually ever, has a tractor ever fallen down a crevasse? I believe they have in the past. Um, I can't tell you how long ago that's been that since one's fallen in a crevasse. Um, I have not seen a tractor lost in a crevasse on the snow here, um, but I, I'm sure there have before. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we don't want that. We don't want to have you experience that. I guess too. <laughs> um, okay, so actually, well. I guess we don't want you to experience that, but we have got a question here from Hattie, who's nine, who wants to know what the scariest thing has happened to you in Antarctica. Um, for me is, uh, I guess the scariest thing that's happened to me would be that I've, I've actually had a crevasse open up as I drove over it, um, but it was nothing that would have, that we would have fallen in. It's just, it was like hitting a speed bump on a tractor. Um, it just, you see it and it, you get a little worried, but um, it was nothing, nothing major. Um, we were able to safely pass over it. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> what happens when you then having to go back or then? Is it a problem when then you have to then go back? Uh, when we go back, we passed over and then we, we filled it in with snow. So it was no longer an issue. Okay. Um, so here's a question from um, a school in Aberdeen in Scotland, Kitty's Brewer School. They want to know if you've seen the Northern Lights. I have. Um, we could only see the Northern Lights if you, for most folks, it's if they wintered here. And I've wintered at the South Pole and I was able to see the Northern Lights for several months. It was, it, it's quite the show. It was very nice. I have a good friend, um, Robert, who, who wintered there he has the record right now for most winners at pole and he's he's told me all about it learned uh, i've learned a great deal from him um about the northern lights it's it's an amazing sight to see i'm lucky um we're wondering georgina's wanting to know if they can see more of outside where you are because you're our only you're our only speaker this week who's actually in antarctica so i wonder if we could just see another flash of outside yeah let me let me bring this over again and i'll just try that pretty good and so remind us what time is it where you are now it is 11 15 p.m friday night um december 4th and it look and it's still really light so here in the uk at the moment it's getting dark at you know sort of four o'clock in the afternoon so <laughs> much different um yep. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got another question here. Who wants to know? Um, Archie would like to know how long does it actually take to build a berm? 
Um, it, we do it in a few days, several days. It, it might take, and also depends on the size of berm we're making, but for the most part, it takes about one day to pile all the snow up and then you want it, that snow to harden um, for about a day. So you'll let it harden and you might pile some more on top of that and then let it sit and harden. And then you'll, you'll cut the top of it off so you have a nice flat surface to sit everything. So it, it could take up to four or five days um, longer if the berm's bigger. Um, and here's something that we hope would never happen, and I don't know if it would, but we hope it would never happen. Have you ever had a fuel bladder burst, and how would you deal with it? So I have never had a fuel bladder burst. Um, that would be a huge, huge issue. Um, but right now we have, we do carry spill containments with us, um, absorbent pads, all kinds of stuff. So if it does happen, we would, we would minimize it. Uh, we would try to patch it so it, we could lose as, li as little fuel as possible. Um, but I have not had one burst and I hope I never do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, going back to the burns, uh, we've got a question here from William who wants to know how tall they are, how big you build them. Does it depend on what, you know, what you build them it, it depends. You yep, it, a lot of it will depend on where we're at in Antarctica. Some places will accumulate snow more than others. Um, so some places there was a picture in uh, in the slide that it it was uh, it was probably about twenty feet tall. I'm not sure what that is in meters. Um, some of them we don't make them nearly that tall. It might be uh, six feet tall. Um, it just it all kind of depends where we're at and how much accumulation happens in that area. Yeah. Um, and then we have another question from um, Fiona in Caerphilly, Wales, who wants to know if the fuel freezes. No, so we use we do not use typical diesel fuel or gasoline. We we use uh, A and eight, which is a type of jet fuel, or mo gas, which is a very refined fuel as well. And they have extremely low freezing points to where we don't have to worry about it freezing. <laughs> That's good. Um, so we saw a little clip in the um, video, but uh, maybe you can expand on this. Royal, the Royal School in Wolverhampton want to know how you keep yourselves entertained when you're going on the long journeys. <laughs> yeah, there's a, uh, so when we're out there, we're with a very small group. So you get to become very good friends with everyone you're with. Um, well, depending who you're with, some people like to play games. We'll play card games or board games. You'll read a book. Um, I've seen people do drawings. Um, they pick up different activities, uh, whatever they can to keep them busy. Um, yeah, there, it, it's a lot of arts and crafts type of thing. <laughs> and bread making by the looks of it. <laughs> and bread making. <laughs> okay, so um, year four of River Beach um, Primary School wants to know how long it takes to clear the snow at the start of each season. So. Yep, um, that also depends where we're at. Uh, if it's high accumulation, it's going to take a while. Uh, for us, typically, to dig out, it takes about one day to dig the snow out from each vehicle. Um, so it depends on how many how many pieces of equipment is at what site. So I've also got another question here from Megan at Merchants Academy Primary, and they want to know how do you have to have a license? For the tractors, do you have to have a license to drive them? We uh, we look for operators who are used to working on equipment. We do require them to have a valid driver's license um, to operate any equipment on on the continent. Other than that, it's we're looking for experience wise as far as the background if they've operated equipment before, um, and that's it. That's great. So um, I've got a question here um, from Pocklington. I think that's Pocklington School. It says, have you had any animal sightings while traversing? Yes, uh, especially if, if the traverse starts out on McMurdo, uh, you'll see skuas, which is a type of bird. It's, it's a fairly large bird. Um, there's some penguins that hang around McMurdo, seals, um, things like that. Uh, as when you get as you start traversing further into the continent, you see very little wildlife. Every now and then, you may see a bird, a skua, or a snow petrel, um, but it's not very likely. 
Awesome. And Danielle would like to know which part of your job you enjoy the most. I like, I like the part where there's not, I, I like the feeling that you're going to send me out to a very remote place in the world. And I'm responsible for getting equipment that no one's seen for several months and is buried under snow up and running and do all the repairs and make it work for a season to support all this science. Um, I, I enjoy that part, just the, the, the getting everything ready. The fact that there's not that many people that have done this before. Um, it's just, it's all exciting. And you touched on this earlier on your talk, but maybe you could, you know, explain a bit more. George would want to know why the caterpillar tracks a triangular. Maybe rather than having there. <laughs> so the, the, the tracks themselves are very square. Um, but looking at it, the cab is, is nice and wider, and then it comes further into it, kind of like a triangle towards where the engine's at. Um, it's just because we don't need, it's, they don't need all that, they don't need to make it completely squared all the way to the front. It saves material, I suppose. <laughs> okay. I think also they were talking maybe about the, rather than um, wheels, they, they have the, the tracks. Maybe I wasn't, you know. Oh, the tracks. Oh, yeah. I got you. Yeah, okay. sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's the design from, from manufacturers it also helps it to where they could roll easily over everything and anything they come across. Um, if they were, I guess, round is a hard shape to make a track. Um, so you, you need a nice flat surface. So we have a large traction area um, and just putting another idler up top to, to go off and just makes the everything nice and triangle. I, <laughs> The, the way the way they come out, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay, so I've got a question here from Martin. How many vehicles are used in a traverse? Does it depend how much, how many things you're transporting? Depends on what we're transporting and what traverse you're going on. Um, right now, uh, the largest traverse I know of is 14 tractors. Um, the smallest one has been four that I know of. Okay. Um, and uh, Jonah, age seven, would like to know if you take turns cooking all the meals. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's part of the job. Uh, we all signed up uh, to come down here, and part of it's you take turns cooking. Everybody cleans. Everybody pulls. Everybody, everybody does everything to help make life as easy as possible. Um. Okay, there's just question after question. It's very difficult. Um, so actually, now that you showed us the picture again, and it's still light there at 11 o'clock at night, um, one of the questions I've got here is that how long did it take you to get used to sleeping in constant daylight? That, <laughs> it took a while. Um, here in McMurdo, it's not so bad because we're in rooms and we could, we have curtains that will go over the window and they can make it dark. Out at field camps or in traverses, um, especially field camps where you're sleeping in a tent, uh, you can't do that. You you get used to wearing something over your face um, to make it dark. Um, that took a while for me. Um, I'm not sure if I really got used to it. I just kind of accepted it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess actually. Maybe this doesn't happen. Isabel, age five, wants to know if you see the stars at night in Antarctica. But I guess maybe it not if it, it's, it's all light at the time at the moment. So right now you won't see any stars. Um, but during the winter, when the sun goes down, you'll see lots of stars. It, it, some of the most beautiful nights I've ever seen have been down here. Mm -hmm. So coming back to your work, um, also with Danielle says, what skills do you need to do your job? Mine is we we look for heavy equipment mechanics. Um, so a lot of work with with diesel engines, um, construction equipment, agricultural equipment, uh, just several years experience in that. Um, because when you go out to these field camps, sometimes it's one mechanic by themselves. Sometimes you might have two. So we need that we need techs that are able to handle anything that is thrown at them. Mm -hmm. And then other people who are in your team, Josh has asked, what's the mountaineer's job on the Traverse? 
I'm I sorry, say that again. What is the mountaineer's job on the traverse? <clears throat> I guess because it looks so flat, maybe what does the mountaineer <laughs> So we carry a mountaineer because if, if a, we come across a crevasse, um, we have to we have to investigate the crevasse. So there were we're strapped to ropes, um, which if someone happens to fall in, their job is to help get us them out. Um, so there's climbing and rope work. Uh, a lot of it too is we they'll they teach us a lot about safety sub, uh, subjects such as just making sure we're you know, we're eating and we're staying healthy and uh, we're not getting too cold. Um, it, it's more, it, it, it's quite a few things that they take care of. And um, this time of year, Laura's asked, you know, do you celebrate Christmas over there? We do. Uh, we celebrate Christmas. Uh, when it comes up, we'll, we'll have a nice little dance and relaxation. Uh, some people exchange gifts, um, call family. Um, it, it's, a, it's a nice time. That's good. Um, lots of comments about your hat, Fabian. People like your hat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Kristen Hayden, um, who's eight from Leicester, it's a city in the UK, would like to know what you miss most from home when you're away. What I end up missing most, uh, I think the first thing that comes to me is, is uh, I like a lot of spice in my food and I don't necessarily get that here. Uh, so that, that's one of the things I miss right away. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is an interesting question here from Thomas. He wants to know how you manage um, without all the equipment you'd normally use in a workshop, if you presses and power tools and things, do you actually have to carry all those with you or how would you manage without them? So we don't have presses. Uh, we do carry some power tools. Um, electric tends to be the way we could go because um, air is kind of, we do have some air tools, but it's a little harder to manage um, to get everything started up and everything. Um, most of it's a lot of hand tools, um, but we do have a few small presses, nothing big. If it comes across something that we need big tooling for, uh, we'll take apart the section of the vehicle, put it in a plane, send it back to McMurdo where they have all that tooling. They'll do the work there and then send it back. Okay. Um, a lot of these are the as similar as we have about encountering animals, which we've already touched upon. Um, okay. What is, uh, Demish Mage 8, what is in the big holes in the ice? If you come across a crevasse, what is actually in the crevasse? It, it's uh, nothing. It's just a, it's a big gap in the snow is all it is. Okay. So I know that there's a question somewhere in amongst all this about how, how big actually the crevasses are or how deep they are. I suppose it varies, but. Um, yep. They, they vary. Um, they, va they vary in our, our tractors because they're tracked. They could drive over crevasses very safely. Um, we have certain guidelines on if they're so wide, um, we have to do something about it. Um, if they're narrower, we could just drive over. Um, that's, a, that's a big complicated situation there, but it, they all vary. We wouldn't know until we investigate them. Okay. So actually with that, Fabian, I think actually we're already up. Our hour is already up, which is uh, amazing that we've come to, you know, it's gone very quickly. But um, thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, you know, all the way from Antarctica. It's very exciting. And um, I hope, I guess you're going to go to bed now. Maybe it's a bit late for you. But, um, and to everyone else, I'm really glad that you uh, could join us as well. So thank you. And I hope you enjoyed the talk. I'll yep, say goodbye. Thank you. Uh, bye, all. Um, enjoy yourselves. <laughs>